Good afternoon. This is Susan Lawton from sunny New Jersey and Deborah Wayland. Hey, Deb. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? I am just great. It's, the sun is shining on me. I am so happy. Getting Yay. that vitamin D rays. <laughs> Yay. Well, we're getting together today to share a very difficult topic. I get a lot of people asking me questions about when there's a loss in the family or a dramatic change, how do I talk to my kids? Because the biggest issues are communicating our own adult fears to children and causing them anxiety. So Deb and I got together and Deb has been an educator for more than 30 years of children basically under sixth grade, right, Deb? Yes. Mm -hmm. And she's seen them through lots of losses in the classroom, so we have lots of good suggestions for laymen on what to say and what not to say and how to help kids through difficult times in spite of our adult anxiety. But thank you for joining us. And Deb, mm -hmm. tell us why you wanted to do this. Well, you know, children go through things differently than adults. Um, they experience um, a lot of different things. It shows up in school a little bit different. And teachers and lay people are limited in what they're able to do to help children. So um, there's just some techniques and um, from some research on just how, how to help the child get through these difficult times because you never know what's going to happen to them during the day at school. So hopefully this will give you know, everyone some suggestions in how they can help the child through this difficult time. Okay. Yeah, and our, our little picture just says it shouldn't hurt to be a child. And, you know, it, as a teacher and educator and caregiver, um, you know, you really just hate to see your child in pain, and sometimes you just don't know how to stop it, you know. And some of them it's not as easy as putting a Band-Aid on. So hopefully some of the ideas and things that we talk about today um, will give you some guidance. Well, that's what we're, that's what we're going to want to do because um, we get so many questions. And I get questions in church groups. I get questions when we're working hospice units. You know, how do I prepare my child? A lot of parents don't realize it's very traumatic for themselves and for the kids when they lose a pet, they lose a home, they lose a best friend who's moved away. All these things affect children differently than they affect us. What? Tell us about what you've seen in these areas, Deb. Um, I've seen um, children actually everything that you've actually mentioned, the loss of a pet, for some it's very, very traumatic. It's normally one of the first losses they go through when they're young. The last um, many years of my career I've been dealing with kindergarten um, age children, so that's one of the things they go through. Um, but a lot of them also experience the loss of a friend, and in that some due to illness, believe it or not, um, early on and some just like you said to moving away and you know oh my gosh I've lost my best friend so um, you know we do need to know how to work them through that um, so it's not always necessarily a death but it is some sort of loss and it does interfere with with all of their being with how they act in school sometimes they want to go sit alone you know at the lunch table rather than with their group of friends so there's a lot of things that we all need to look out for um, just to help them, again, work themselves through what's going on. And one of the things we've talked about before with some of our adult attendees is what constitutes initiating grief many times is something that occurs that changes our life over which we had no control and no part of the decision-making. So words like, when's it going to be normal again, Mom? When am I going to feel the same again? And things you can say are, we're going to establish a whole new normal because things are now different. Right. And this was part of the research you did, and I thought this is a great chart. And I know you've seen parts of this. Can you talk to us about it? 
Sure. Um, you know, children, there's a lot of discrepancy as to whether children actually understand grieving when they're young, but they do. They experience feelings and they're aware of death or loss, even if they don't understand it. And unfortunately, media today, um, death and dying and has become such a common theme in cartoons and television and video games. So um, understanding sometimes comes later, but the familiarity with it is there. And um, Doug Manning actually says, you know, the feelings need a hug. And part of that is that a lot of young children, a loss or death or dying or a serious illness or, you know, watching grandma being sick in the hospital bed or things like that, it just makes them feel very insecure and afraid. So that's a lot of the feelings that they're going on to or what I've observed um, from my own personal, my own students. Um, three to five years, children at this age, they don't necessarily view it as permanent. You know, and again, we blame that a lot on the media. You know, things happen in a cartoon and a few scenes later, um, that character is alive and well again. Um, Six to nine years old, the children do begin to grasp the concept of death and they understand that the person will never come back. And then, of course, nine to 12, they understand it's an inevitable part of life and death may come earlier than expected. And I know teens and, and Sue has a lot more experience at this level. Um, they have a different understanding about death and, and a lot of other things um, can happen to them while they go through this process. So... Um, but we're going to be sticking with the younger children for now because that's where I've had, you know, most of my experience. Right. And one of the things you and I've talked about before is people need to understand what their job is. And we talked right. about some unusual situations you've been pressed into at school that didn't necessarily help. You can describe those things very candidly. That would be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, as a teacher and having a child go through it, they can break down in the middle of the class and just start crying or they might have a little temper tantrum or other things. Um, I had a parent ask me once to um, allow a photo to be brought in for them to put, you know, in their, in their pencil box, in their desk so they can look at it. You know, a lot of times your hands are tied, but as um, Sue and I were saying earlier, that may not be the best thing to do for that child. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of works and what kind of doesn't work. Um, you want to offer the child comfort, but by the same token, what I find works that you keep the same routine, you make them feel safe, you make them feel secure. So you can't stop in the middle of your lesson to go over and comfort them. You offer them some words like, well, okay, well, now we're working on, you know, practicing our sounds of W and try to move them through it that way. Um, you know, experiencing grief firsthand is very confusing to a child and it's confusing to a teacher as well because a lot of times we're not even aware of all the circumstances around, you know, surrounding their loss. So without that information, one has to be very careful as to what they're saying to a child. Right. And my advice to teachers and adults in different situations with children, whether you're a next door neighbor, you're an aunt, and there's a loss in the family to deal with children, please remember their first need is for safety. So they need to feel safe no matter what kind of hysterics, what kind of drama, what kind of unusual cultural habits are part of this process. It's very important that you help them as a teacher, as a counselor, just plain participate with what used to be normal. In a classroom, their job is to be at school. If their grief is such that they can't handle it, then let them stay home until they're ready to come in. I really feel very strongly about that because quite by accident, you can be reinforcing bad behavior. You can give attention to things through people's own fears, their own unsettledness about somebody dying. You can communicate those things to kids because if you say, oh, how are you doing, honey? Or what did you say that one teacher did? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah we were talking earlier uh, when 
I, you know, we would travel through the hallway together as a class. Um, I had a, a teacher who came in and, you know, ran up to the student because they knew from an older sibling what had happened. Oh, how are you? I've been so worried about you. And they're, you know, they're hugging them and doing all this in the hallway. And, like, the rest of the students are kind of looking at them. And, you know, and it's just, it's not appropriate. And you could see this particular one person, you know, they're get, kind of getting teary-eyed and they're really reacting so differently than what I tried to portray in my classroom. And, you know, actually one of the students said to me, like, why are they doing that? And um, you were telling the story about how, you know, children get on board with grieving from that from the movie, remember? Yes. You know. Um, kindergarten cops. So, you know, if kids are getting specialized attention because of that, it may cause other acting out behaviors or, you know, other things to occur. Well, oh, let me, you know, act like that so I can be getting those hugs and things. So, um, learn your place, learn how to keep that intact. Don't go telling stories about your own personal loss or things like that. Children just don't need to hear that and just continue with the routine again. Safe and security is what what needs to go on in that environment. Right, because when you quietly with your students, because you're known in your entire district for being the calm, you know, <laughs> routine establisher. Yes, I am. Respect you. The kids respect the rules. They all mm -hmm. feel very safe. You told me when they had the lockdown last time. Four first graders who were your kids the previous year ran into your room. They wouldn't even stay in their own classroom That's because right. they were afraid they came to where it was safe. So when you communicate, the routine is important. You know, I'm sure that grandma, you know, loves you, blah, blah, blah. Keep moving. Do not give them undue attention. Again, you don't know what else has gone on for those other students in the classroom. You don't know who believes exactly. in God. You don't know who believes in Nothing, you don't know what their rituals are. You don't always know what another person's experience is. So you really got to be very careful. Right. You're offering them um, ways to cope with what, you know, what you're just trying to give them that support to get through it. Um, one of the people suggests that um, helping kids through grief is just protecting them Um as best as you can from the pain of loss, but giving them coping skills, giving them ways to deal with what they're feeling. And again, for a young child, just as having seen it, they're, they just don't know. You know, if something happened to a parent of theirs, even if it wasn't death, but it was a, an illness, one of the one of the moms was um, was pregnant, and this little girl came in like really upset because mommy had been away. She would have had to be in the hospital for a while, and so to her that was like, "Hey, mommy's missing. Mommy's gone," and um, you know it was just reinforcing her. No, you're fine. When you go home, you can talk to daddy or grandma. You know whoever was there. So you want to encourage them to talk. You know, let them know how they're feeling at home, but um, you just want to again continue with your day and continue with the routine, whether for me it was my school classroom or for you at, you know, at home, in your own home environment, just get them, you know, keep them with what's familiar to them. Um, just really fast to go through um, how kids grieve differently. Um, some children, they have mood springs. They'll cry one minute, go to the next. It doesn't mean that they're not feeling sad. Um, or that they're not grieving. It's just the way, you know, their brain works. Their brain works so different than ours. They don't hold on to those thoughts the same way. So even within the classroom, one minute a child could be crying in the corner and feeling sad, and the next minute they're back to the routine. We're able to get them back in, and they're doing okay. Um, they can experience depression, guilt, anxiety, or anger. Again, it can be directed at one person. Um, or someone else, so you just want to keep your eye, your eyes open, and look for those uh, for those signs in your child or grandchild or you know niece or nephew, whoever you're who's ever going through it. And of course, with really young children, some of the most overt signs is that they may regress a little bit. They might start wetting the bed again, or kind of do that baby talk. And and so it's just just again to be aware of these signs and and um, knowing that you have to do a little bit more to help them go through it. 
And it's really important that you encourage kids to express feelings, but don't make it a point. Let things happen naturally. Right. And again, in certain situations, like um, Sue said before, we all have a job. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a grief counselor. I'm, that's not my area. I'm not any, a, any th certified therapist. So I can't take the time out of my day to sit there and kind of work through what that child's going through um, when they're having these emotional episodes or anything. I'm not you know, certified to give that kind of advice. So what do you do? You offer, again, the security of that routine. Um, and um, some of the things they do, and we actually have um, certified personnel come in, is they do deal with this topic. Um, they come in um, certain grades every year, and they read books about death and things like that. And um, so, uh, it, and they do professionally help children deal with some of the, some of these uh, harder topics. So, um, just there's some suggestions here. There's many, many in your libraries, and um, you know they can support what your own personal beliefs are. You know your religious beliefs and what you want, but um, they're really amazing books. Um, <clears throat> so just quickly, you know, they can be serious or they can be silly, like when dinosaurs die or something just like I miss you or when I feel worried. Um, so there's a lot of different varieties, and we have a listing of that for you. Yeah, we have the books and authors all listed. We're all happy to send it to you in email. Right. Um, a lot of things they're finding helpful, and a lot of kids on their own know how to do this. If they can't express themselves, they draw pictures. They build scrapbooks, looking at photo albums, like at home with them. Sometimes they want to see pictures of the one, the person that they lost, even if it's just their pet. They want to tell stories about them. Oh, remember when, you know, Smokey, my cat, climbed up into the tree and we had to call 911 to help get them down. It's okay to talk about that. Um, you know, or draw a lot of the kids draw a lot of pictures um, and they hand them to me even just, you know, every day. There are some books in, available um, online and there's books in the stores if you need help helping them go through it. A lot of times you just need to give them guidance for what you want to talk about. And I know, Sue, you've talked about. Um, you know, some people want to share those memories and others don't, and that you kind of have to just go by what they're, what hints they're providing you, right? Oh, yeah. And the thing is, like, older kids, you can help them express through filling in blanks, writing out stories, just like you talked about. But right. this has to be something they initiate. Please mm -hmm. do not take on, okay, today we're going to talk about our feelings. Please don't uh. do that. Because yeah. they may not have any feelings. And if they're merely reflecting fears or uncertainty they've heard from other adults, let them ask the questions they want and answer as simply as possible. Mm -hmm. One of the things again, that comes up a lot is people will say, well, my aunt is being treated by chemotherapy and I hear my mom on the phone crying. I don't know what that means. So you have to refer them back to their parents and say you need to ask them questions because it's not fair for you to jump the gun and explain about death and dying. You don't know how the family wants to approach the next life. You don't know if they're told everybody someone is going to pass. You don't have answers, so you can't make assumptions. Please, being working in this area for a long time, the number one thing I figured out was no two people are alike. Some people believe in angels. Some people believe in an afterlife. Some people have no idea. And some people are very afraid of whatever's coming next. So as adults, we have a list of experiences that cause us fear, and it's really important we not communicate our fears to innocent children. And if it is something about my aunt is going to go to the next life, well, again, refer them back to the immediate family. What do they want to do? What do they want to say? 
You could send home lists of books if you think that's helpful. But please don't take it on unless you're properly educated. Because you'll give them far too much information. All adults, when it comes to emotions and children, give far too much information thinking they're being open. Not true. Right. Because no, you're very good about keeping things simple with kids, Deb. They feel very secure. Right, they do. And um, a lot of times, like, they may say something and I just kind of, I hear them, I listen to them, and I redirect. I try to change the subject, move them on, move them forward. For Again, for all the same reasons that Sue said, I don't know what's going on in their family. I told you the story of the little boy whose um, father passed away, but they actually never told him that. Um, and so, and they told me they didn't tell him that. So luckily they gave me a heads up. So there was nothing that I could really say or do. That was the way they were coping. So, you know, you have to be really careful. And sometimes in our exuberance to be helpful, we say silly things like um, somebody went to sleep. And I know for some children that's really, really scary. And then they're afraid of going to bed. And that's normal. That's come up. You know, you have the child who's really tired. You see the dark circle under their eyes. And, you know, I call the parent and say, look, you know, I'm really concerned about, you know, your daughter. She's, you know, she's tired. She's falling asleep in class, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that there was a loss of a grandma who had been ill. And they told her about, you know, going to sleep. And so this poor child was now afraid to close her eyes at night. So we have to be really careful about what we say and how we say it. So being untrained, um, I'm very careful as to what I, I just offer some comfort to the child and say it's okay and let's move on. So, right. Please, I know don't, Sue, judge, you know. please don't judge what exactly. is not yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw this slide, and it's so true. Gone, any type of gone. It's the saddest word in the lang in the language in any language, whether it's, you know, our our pet fish, our dog, a grandma, our best friend. Um, we have to recognize that it does cause a sadness in our children, and we have to be there to work through them. Open lines of communication are just so helpful. But again, not ours, theirs. <laughs> yeah, let them tell you how they feel. Please don't organize it for them. Please don't. Yes. You know, uh, Be normal. Help them establish what's normal. Right. You said, like, um, we don't want to organize feelings, but we do want to organize their routine. So, um, like you said, Sue, stay um Find comfort in all the routines. Let them stay involved in their activities as long as they're feeling up to it. Um, keeping them involved in their dance or their sports or their clubs um, are, is very helpful as they go through any kind of loss or grieving. What else should they do, Sue? Well, remind them to look at Mother Nature. All the seasons change. The trees oh. and the flowers. The flowers come up. They have buds. They bloom. They're finished. Everything has a season. Talk to them in very general terms. You know, one of the things we do, you just refresh my memory, what we do in school this time of year all the time is the, the caterpillar. And that's an amazing thing for kids to understand. And we read the story of the very hungry caterpillar. And, you know, a lot of butterflies have a really short lifespan, but they watch them. You know, eat their way, get bigger, bigger, turn into their chrysalis, turn into this beautiful butterfly and go away. So, you know, there are things that we can do such as that. I mean, even parents can get kids to do that and let, the, let them see that whole process, which is amazing. Right. It's normal. It's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. It's not a deviation. Right. Um, you also want to make sure uh, that they have um, coping activities. They found this cute little butterfly. Um, they can draw. They can exercise. Um, they can cry if they want to. They're singing. You know, take your baths. Have your healthy routine. Eat healthy. Let them play with their pet. Go to the movies. You know, these are all things that just keep them normal, part of their normal day. Let them know what 
reality is right now. And even though you're going, maybe going through your own grief, um, these are all ways to help even adults, you know, move forward and help their child move move on from all their feelings. It says resilience isn't just a gift of nature and exercise of will. Resilience grows through positive experiences, supportive environments, and the caring intervention of others. And that's um, a lot of what we're talking about. This is how we're going to help children get through what they're going through, through whether it's sickness, long-term illness, separation from a best friend, or the loss of a loved one. Right, and if you communicate in a very calm manner, the simplicity of what's taking place, like grandma's been sick a lot because she got cancer, and that happens to a lot of people, and the medication makes them sick, but we fully expect everything is going to be fine. It's just going to take a while. Or grandma's having medication, and she's fighting really hard, but she may be going to pass on. I just want to prepare you for that. You keep it as simple as possible, and when you say things like pass on, you need to let them ask, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we were talking earlier, um, Sue, that many, for many children, it is the death of a pet will be their first exposure, and um, a lot of children form really strong bonds with their, with their pets. They dress them up. They make them their playmates. So, um, you know, it really is a good friend for them. So, again, you can't minimize the importance of a pet. You can't tell stories, you know, about, oh, we sent them out to the farm. You know, be as real as possible and letting them know what's going on with a pet. A lot of families feel like they need to run out and get another, a replacement pet. And that's not always the best thing. You have to really think about whether that's going to be the best thing for your child because they need time to grieve. We can't run out and replace our friends or our family members if we lose them. So, um, and a lot of times with the loss of a of a an elderly relative like a grandparent, um, they start to worry very young children about you know. Well, something going to happen to my mom, or something going to happen to my dad. So again, we have to prepare them for um, for life and life, but things that occur in life, which is loss and grief. Right, and then it's a normal part, and that sometimes mm -hmm. the sad parts help us appreciate the unsad parts. Yeah, and kids do sometimes worry about well. If dad passed away, is mom going to be next? Is my aunt going to be next? What's going to happen? And you just have to assure them we don't know. You got to say things like, it's okay to tell a kid you don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's why we appreciate every day. You refocus. You help them refocus on participating in the moment rather than anxiety about the future. Right. You always want to reassure a child that they're loved and that they're always going to be taken care of because, again, a lot of those feelings stem back to what we were talking about earlier, their need to feel secure, their need to feel safe. So we just want to constantly remind them of that and make them feel that way. All right. And if we need to rely on other members of our family to help um, with that, um, we do that as well. And, again, as a teacher, you know, I always refer them back to talk to their parents or whoever their caretaker is in these situations. You know, um, the child that breaks down crying in my classroom, you know, okay, it's okay. You know, when you go home, let mom or dad know how you're feeling and encourage that. Remember that death leaves a heartache that no one can heal. Love leaves a memory that no one can steal. And um, I, I thought this was appropriate. You know, so many people don't want to talk about um, the recent loss. And sometimes those, those discussions, again, if a child is up for it, um, they really just reinforce all the, the memories of what has gone on. So th those make some nice deep impressions on the children and help them cope as well. Right. And like you said earlier, one of the most important things you can do is listen without judging. Right. Listen 
without asking deep questions. Ask simple questions like, oh, okay, or do you have more to say about that? Please don't mm -hmm. judge by the nature of your questions. Music can help us speak words we can't always express. Listening to music can help children express their feelings. Um, we recommend a lot of instrumentals. And as a little time passes, if it is a parent or a grandparent who has spent a lot of time with the child, we recommend rhythm and games and creative mm -hmm. expressions. Just let them create, let them draw, let them paint. But if that wasn't part of their normal life before grandma left, don't try to make it a replacement because you can't. Right. There are, there are no quick fixes to grief. There's no easy answers. Every expression of grief that wants to be felt and honored and given its space must be allowed in order to heal. All right, we can't expect our children to get over things right away. Um, there was, um, I was telling Sue about a little child that I had that they just allowed her to come in my room and scream and cry when she came in. They said, just let her be like that. Um, it wasn't the place she needed to be. It was coming to school was actually creating a lot more um, anxiety for her. So, you know, sometimes in those instances, like Sue said before, you know, let them keep home, let them stay home, let them work through all of that first because it was upsetting the routine of everyone else um, by allowing her to do that. They thought it was good if they kind of forced her to go there. Um, the principal actually carried her in one day and all it did was just kind of upset the apple cart for the normal in my room. So, um, you know, these are things that we have to look at. You know, some children are going to take a lot longer than others and we just have to, you know, be aware of that. Right. And it wasn't that the girl was doing anything wrong. It just no. wasn't the appropriate time or place. And right. And again, we don't know what the impact is on other children in that environment who'd never suffered a loss. You mm -hmm. can create a whole new level of fear and anxiety that was totally unnecessary by allowing extraordinary drama to take place. And we were talking earlier, too, one of the most important things that anyone can be in these situations is to be a good listener. And as a teacher, as a Sunday school teacher or a religious ed teacher, you know, even the extracurricular activities, if your child goes to karate or for music lessons, we cannot, um, or you have to be very non judgmental. We just have to have a good listening ear and just, you know, hear what they're saying and try to keep um, the their, their routine going. Keep it, again, normalcy, normal as possible. Right, it's really um, important because non-judging, and it's very important when you go to ask a question, think about it. Are you going to lead the child to new anxiety by asking this question? Like the teacher that approached the little one in front of you, oh, I was so worried about you. Uh, yeah. And the child's response is, well, what's supposed to be happening? She's worried. I don't understand. Okay. Right. You're introducing concepts that are unnecessary, or you're introducing fears that are adult-like into a child who's just trying to figure out how she's going to survive with things that are changing to, over which she has no control. Mm -hmm. Oh, I threw this in here. Um, this really is such a fun project, and sometimes kids just need a fidget toy. They need something in their hands. Even adults, we need to do this. And one of the simplest things to do is just um, get them a latex balloon, and you fill it, believe it or not, with Play-Doh. And they're able to squeeze it. This was recommended for one of my students by um, by a therapist, they were getting you know professional help, and they were just allowed to keep it in their desk. But I mean, sometimes this is just good at home. You know, they they 
they form an attachment to a, to a stuffed animal or a favorite book, carry it around, and sometimes this is just something else to work through um, some of their emotions. And it's a fun thing, too. Attending this is always funerals the is very unique to each family, each ethnic tradition, what's expected, what's not expected. Mm -hmm. Every family is different. And visiting the wake, those things can all be different. And if your child has a friend who lost their mother, it's very appropriate for you to take the classmate, your child, to the funeral home and let them go through just the receiving line and then take them back home. They need to understand this is a part of life. If you don't want to take them up to the casket, you don't have to do that. But to pretend, you know, their friend isn't going through this is also not real. We have to be part of real world. And if you let them visit with their friend, their friend will probably be relieved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because, again, that's part of their normal, seeing their friend. So um, I'm sure that will give them a little break of all the tension and anxiety going on in the classroom. But, again, no one person can dictate to any one of us what the right or wrong thing is to do. Um, and even though we might explain to the children what happens, sometimes they may not react in the way that we want them to, right? I mean, oh, they yeah, just... You don't, you don't have any idea how they're going to react. But right. please remember whose safety it is your mm -hmm. job to be concerned about. Exactly. Um, they do uh, recommend for those people that decide, you know that you're not, they're not going to have the child go to the funeral for whatever reason, that there's other ways to acknowledge that, and sometimes they plant a tree, they take times to share stories. They, I've seen a lot of um, people release balloons now just as a way of maybe giving a little bit of closure to the child. So whatever you feel is comfortable um, in, 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 in that, whether you they go or not go, there are a lot of other things. And... Uh, Again, you know, if it is a loss within a family, the mom and dad may be going through it as well. And, you know, they're going to be showing their emotions and they're going to have times that they're feeling upset or sad. So um, you, ha you can't ignore your own grief as well. Right. You have okay. to take measures. And it's okay to be human and it's okay to tell your kids, I'm just human. I'm just overwhelmed with sadness. It'll pass. We all love each other. It's all going to work out. Right. And you just want to show them healthy ways of dealing with, with the stress. Not not throwing, you know, not having a big fit. Right, Sue? Yes. And, oh, one more thing. Lately, a lot of people are doing cremation and they're picking up urns. And I've had several sessions lately with families wanting to know, you know, I want to have the urn with grandma in it on the mantle, and my daughter gets hysterical every time she sees it. Well, like, what do you think? Hello? If she doesn't want it in the living room, then put it in a closet. Put it in the basement. Talk to her about it. Introduce it. Mm -hmm. Explain, you know, grandma's here until summer, and we're going to take her out into the ocean because that's where she wants her ashes spread. Be candid about these things. Mm -hmm. Emotionalize it by discussing ahead of time what's going to happen. You can't just be freaking out, okay? Because if you're freaking yeah. out, they're going to freak out. And no, that's so true. We can send you, if you're interested, these are great books that Deb researched, and they all have something interesting depending on the situation to support your having communication with your children. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite? You know, I do, there's so many of them that I, I like. Um, and again, it's a set, it depends on whether you want to do a more realistic story 
or like um, I know that when the group came to my classroom they read the story when dinosaurs die and that was really nice and then um, Samantha's Jane's missing smile that was a wonderful story that I had done with loss of a parent um, you know so I love the feelings journal um, there's a lot of things available online for little activities to help you know your child work through grief and um, the angel catcher for kids was also a really nice journal and you could turn it into a little journal scrapbook thing um, but no they're, they're I really uh, like them um, and I just feel that like you know what your child responds to whether it's more of the you know the cartoonish type or whether you want to see like real life figures in the story so you know go to go to a bookstore browse around and see which one you know you feel is the perfect mix as we said there's so many available for you what about you Sue which one do you like um my, one of my favorites you had found it was when I feel worried by Cornelia uh -huh. because it helps kids identify they have a choice okay yes. mm -hmm. and that's what's Absolutely. really um really really a hard thing for kids to understand that their feelings are separate from others. Sometimes mm -hmm. they only reflect the parents' feelings, but if you notice they're not at peace with things, and again, you have oils that can be helpful. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh, one of our listeners is asking for a book recommendation for sudden death of father for mama to read to elementary aged kids. Let me see. Was there one on sudden death in here? I'm not sure that I had a sudden death, but I did have the Samantha Jane's Missing Smile is about coping with the loss of a parent. Okay. So that one might be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Or um, When Someone Very Special Dies um, by Marge um, Hegard. Very nice story as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's a case of it, it's really tough. And the first holiday where grandma was part or she made her special cake or something like that comes up. The first time that happens, you got to make room. Some people make room at the table the first year. And we say, you know, we're celebrating Thanksgiving without grandma, but we can remember how much her life touched our life and we're grateful for. And people can still list the things, and especially the children, that they remember about grandma. They love the Rice Krispie treats. Or they always liked the fact that grandma would sneak them an extra jelly bean. Whatever the affectionate ways that they remember the people who've passed, it's okay to include them in the holidays. And guilt, right. remember, guilt was intended by gentlemen. Remember that? Because Satan uh -huh. wants people to be unhappy and hopeless. You should feel guilty about wanting to bring up something good about somebody who passed away because it might make somebody feel bad. See, that's right. the part where you need to bring it up first so they understand it's normal to miss grandma who was always here and snuck you extra treats. It's normal. You don't have to feel bad about bringing that up. And so what if Minnie cries every time you do? That's how Minnie handles it. And it doesn't mean you have to cry, but if you want to, it's okay. Anything so else you true. can think of, Miss Deb? Well, again, well, again I just again from my own experience, um, it's keeping it's normal, normal, keeping on with your routines, um, um, just sharing, sharing as much as possible with the child. child. Sorry, we're getting this getting echo. This echo. Sorry. Sorry. Um, um, and just, and just making them making feel, them feel that, that everything is normal. You can't make them promises that nothing bad will ever happen again. And just give them all the security and love and making them feel safe and talking through the memories as they occur and when the child's, you know, ready. You can't, there's no schedule. You can't force it. You can't, you know, oh, well, within a month they're going to be better. They're going to want to be back doing everything they wanted to do. Maybe not, just like an adult. So just work through it, you know, and provide that security, comfort, and love. And, you know, and it will def definitely, definitely get better. Yeah, the, the thing is, saying phrases like, there's been this big change, whether you're moving to a new house, 
whether you're getting a new car, it's important that you say these words out loud. We are going to have another new normal. This is new normal. This is a new car. This is a new house. This is a new school. And this is exciting because life is about change. When you say mm -hmm. these things out loud, kids get the idea, oh, this is normal. Okay, change is just what happens. Okay, whoopee. It's important that you say it and you not save it up for a big bad thing that forces change on you. Right. And, and um, I think it's okay to kind of keep the humor in there, like at school, when schedules are getting changed or we have a surprise thing, you know, we have a new adventure today, you know, and then, you know, it just changes the anticipation of something or our Wednesdays was, were always really silly and crazy and normally those were the ones that went topsy-turvy, so our name for Wednesday was Wacky Wednesday, but it just gets them to realize that even though we want routine, that things do change, and we have to be ready for that. So, um, you know, when we have that spontaneous, like you said, those fire drills or those, you know, our lockdown drills, um, they're scary, but we practice them in advance so that they know what's coming next, and so they're not so scary for them. So, right, um, they understand about feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Feeling I safe the blend. is so important. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, So I said feeling safe is so important. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And did you and come up like with this great Thank you guys for joining us today. We know mm -hmm. sometimes these are really difficult topics, but it happens, right? It does. It's part of the cycle. And thank you, Ms. Deb, for your research and for the great list of books. And yeah, we thank will you send it out to people. Well. And at least yes, seven notes that said thank you. And I'm saying thank you back, guys. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening and joining us today. And we hope that you came away with some ideas on how to help your family going through what they're going through as well. Sue, again, thank you for all your help. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Happy Thursday. Bye.